Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. We're just going to wait uh, a minute or so for um, our last few guests to join. All right, um, let's get started. To share some slides. Um, thank you everyone so much and welcome to the second webinar in the 2022 Summer Institute for Educators series at the University of Chicago. My name is Krishna and I serve as the outreach coordinator at the UChicago Center for Middle Eastern Studies. We're delighted to welcome journalist Sarah Aziza today to present um, a presentation entitled The Violence of Dis Disinformation on Palestine for us this evening. Before we begin, I just wanted to address a few housekeeping items. We encourage all of you to register for the um, June 28th, that's next Tuesday, in-person workshop associated with the Summer Institute for Educators, which is taking place on the University of Chicago campus. Um, the workshop will feature a keynote lecture by Dr. Seema Yasmin on disinformation and media literacy, a panel discussion with journalists Simon Ostrovsky, Sarah Aziza, um, our presenter here tonight, and Ben Mock, who is the presenter at the webinar on Thursday evening, as well as workshops presented by Pulitzer Centers uh, on Crisis Reporting Teaching Fellows and by Pulitzer Center staff. Please find the registration link for the in-person workshop in the chat. Um, I also just wanted to mention that Illinois-based educators in attendance are eligible to receive CPDU credits for participation in this series. More information will be shared at the end of tonight's event about requesting CPDU credits. Um, for those of you who have questions during the event, please post your questions uh, for the speaker using the Q&A feature um, during the event. If you would like to pose a question to the speaker directly, we will have a Q&A um, a dedicated Q&A portion at the end of Sarah's presentation, where you can use the raise hand feature to, uh, you know, close your event or your question live. Um, more instructions about that will be provided in the chat later on. Um, we also encourage you to use the chat feature if you have any difficulties uh, relating to technology during the event. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll try to, you know, fix whatever issue you're having. Um, a quick word on support for this event. Uh, this pro program is made possible through a Title VI National Resource Center grant from the US Department of Education. As a National Resource Center, CMES, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago, sponsors a number of educational programs on the politics, religions, societies, and cultures of the Middle East and North Africa each year. If you would like to host a performance uh, at your school or attend a professional development event workshop with CMES, please contact me or visit our website for a calendar of events. Um, and Joya will be posting some information about that in the chat as well. We're also thrilled to continue our annual partnership with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting to present the Summer Institute for Educators. Um, I will pass it off in just a moment to um, Joya Mukherjee, the program manager from the Pulitzer Center to discuss their programs. Um, Joya, would you like to? Uh, Oh, I'm so sorry. I think I muted you right as you went. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, Krishna. And hi, everyone. I'm so happy to have all of you here. I'm noticing some familiar names from yesterday's webinar, as well as names that I know educators I'm familiar with. So, so excited for all of you to join us today. Uh, my name is Joya. I work with the Pulitzer Center. Um, the Pulitzer Center is a journalism organization. We are dedicated to raising awareness about underreported global issues through direct support for quality journalism. On our next slide, you'll see ways for you to follow us on social media. For the latest information on global underreported stories, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter or visit our website at pulsarecenter.org. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator and guest speaker for today. 
We'll start with our guest speaker, Sarah Aziza. Sarah Aziza is an Arab American writer based in New York City. She has lived and worked in Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Jordan, South Africa, and the West Bank, in addition to the United States. Her work encompasses both journalism and creative arts and explores issues including transnational identity, refugees and migration, gender and women's issues, languages and translation, and social justice. Her works have been featured in the New York Times, Harper's Magazine, and NPR, among others. Her projects have been supported by the Poultry Center. We're also joined by Dr. Thomas E. R. McGuire, who serves as the Associate Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Dr. McGuire received his PhD in Media Studies from the University of Texas at Austin, and he regularly teaches a class at the University of Chicago called Media and Social Change in the Middle East. His dissertation focused on Islamic satellite television, and he has also conducted research on museum uses of social media. Let's welcome Sarah Aziza and Thomas McGuire. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, do I just jump in now with my presentation? There's nothing. I'm just going to share it. Uh, okay. So sorry, just one moment. No problem. Krishna is taking over the technological side. I told them that I'm more comfortable talking than running even the most rudimentary of Zoom procedures. No so. <laughs> All right, so here we go. All right, and yeah, feel free to cue me in whenever you want to change. You can get started. All right, so thank you um, to both the University of Chicago and the Center for Middle East Studies and the Pulitzer Center for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this um, presentation and this discussion that will follow. Um, my title, my, my talk is titled The Violence of Disinformation in Palestine. And I just wanted to pr proceed with a quick content warning. There will be some mention and a few images that include violence. Um, it's nothing too graphic and it's um, sort of the violence of the nature that happens in crowds around protests and things like that. So just be aware of that. Um, but we can go ahead and jump in. Um, you go to the next slide, please. So I'd like to start out with just a quick teaser. Um, I don't know if we're gonna get live audience responses, but just at home as you're looking, I want you to ask yourself if you've ever seen this photo, if you recognize it, um, perhaps you've seen it. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, this picture was shared millions of times um, earlier this year. It was labeled as eight-year-old Ukrainian girl confronting Russian soldier. Um, it went, like I said, around the world overnight, um, virtually overnight um, on TikTok, it garnered 12 million views and roughly a million likes. Um, you know, people were rallying around the Ukrainian cause at that time, if you recall. Um, and there was this outpouring of support and love and, you know, calls to pray, send money, send, you know, whatever, whatever help possible to the Ukrainian people. And there was sort of in the West, this seemingly unilateral um, agreement that the Ukrainian cause was something to um, get behind. And it was, um, you know, sort of understood that this was a invading superpower um, encroaching on a mostly unarmed civilian and innocent population seeking to annex land um, in violation of international law. Um, so it was, it was obvious to many people in the West and all around the world, um, this was, you know, a clear um, story of oppression and story of land theft, and that the um, the people to cheer for, basically, and people to support, were the Ukrainian civilians. Um, ironically, however, this um, image was actually an image of a um, young Palestinian girl. It's actually 11 years old. She was 11 years old and the, the photo is 11 years old. It was actually from 2011 and it's a young girl um, facing down an Israeli soldier telling her go back, you know, telling him to go back. And, you know, you know she, she's standing up to the occupation essentially. Um, the clip was removed from, from TikTok and, you know, it was, it was kind of embarrassing for some folks that they accidentally ended up supporting Palestinian, the Palestinian civilian cause that, in, you know, especially in the case where many, yes, Aha Tamimi, I see the, um, the comment in the chat. So yes, this is Aha Tamimi. So she's actually quite famous and it was extra embarrassing because, um, 
you know, she's a face, it's an image that actually did kind of in its own time go viral. Um, but this sort of points to, um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, it kind of begs the question, you know, is Israel-Palestine that different from other conflicts? Um, because like I said, um, we tend to expect different treatment around the Israel-Palestine conflict, whereas the Ukrainian and Russian conflict, you know, people aren't really, people discuss that conflict in, in, in a very different way. It's a really like um, prescient and relevant example of contrast that we can look at just right now. Um, and I won't be getting into all the historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict tonight, but um, I encourage you, if those parallels aren't obvious, to go ahead and, um, you know, just maybe look into that further on your own. But um, let's just take for um, granted, maybe for our discussion tonight, that there are maybe some um, real historical sort of colonial um, similarities between these two and also between the Russian and Ukrainian conflict and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, as well as in um, comparable sort of like disproportionate asymmetry of power. Um, but let's, let's, let's ask ourselves, why is Israel-Palestine treated so differently in the media? Um, studies show that most people consider Israel-Palestine conflict as uniquely complicated and intractable, whereas, you know, more recent conflicts or some conflicts such as, you know, Israel, um, Ukraine and Russia, um, we, we can sort of point to clear clear sources for the conflict. Um, people tend to think of Israel and Palestine as just this foggy, hazy, um, endemic place of violence. And, um, you know, we just sort of assume that this conflict has been going on for millennia and always, you know, will be. And it's a case of um, people not being able to get along this, this like um, hatred that, you know, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people just have for each other. And it's just such a tragedy that these people can't just agree to have peace. Um, this tends to be, you know, in, in many ways, a very common um, sort of framing that people have about this conflict. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to, to discuss a little bit tonight is, um, what is what role does the media play in this sort of framing and these sort of like passive understandings of the conflict as something that's just there, that's just almost like the climate of that part of the world, just that there will always be fighting and that there is sort of, you know, this, this bewilderment almost, why are they still fighting? Why can't the peace process move forward? Um, and not only what does responsible journalism look like around this issue, but um, what does responsible media consumption or media literacy look like? And as educators, how can we encourage people to take in media and think critically um, in a way that would be more responsible and more accountable? Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So this sort of opens up a, another giant question. I'm just diving right into big, giant, uncomfortable questions tonight. Um, but what is fair reporting? Or what is balanced or fair journalism? Um, and just, you know, throw that out there as, you know, we're not doing a live, you know, back and forth right now. But on your end, just maybe think about what you would define as like fair journalism. And we go to the next slide, please. So um, just as a little context, you know, this we're doing, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a series of lectures or discussions um, discussing misinformation and disinformation around the world. So right now, you know, in the last few years, the, the idea of disinformation um, has become more salient. A lot more people are discussing it, recognizing it, but it tends to maybe bring up um, you know, Russia, China, what are the, what are the powers, you know, the, the bad, like bad faith governments or actors that are, you know, interfering and manipulating people through like actively disseminating misinformation. But my presentation tonight will suggest that actually we have a plenty of misinformation, disinformation here in the United States. And that um, that's something to also think critically about, um, you know, and, you know, the, a lot of times, um, people assume that, well, as long as I'm not going to Russian sources or Chinese sources, et cetera, et cetera, you know, if as long as I'm going to the New York Times or something like that, like I'm, I'm on, on good ground, I'm getting accurate reporting. Um, but just as like a brief survey, we're not going to get into it tonight, but um, the U.S. or, or uh, American media has had a long history of bias and manipulation and politicization. Actually, there's been much more um, 
you know, the, the amount of time that, that um, newspapers and publications have been openly partisan is actually longer than it's been, um, you know, presumably objective in the United States. So, you know, in the 19th century, newspapers, you know, famously, openly, proudly endorsed different candidates um, up until even, you know, I, I included for the Chicagoans in the, in the room um, an excerpt from a 1936 headline um, in the Chicago Tribune that said, only 97 days left to save your country. And this was, you know, um, Robert McCormick, the, um, I believe it was the editor in chief or the publisher of um, the Chicago Tribune was openly anti Franklin Roosevelt. So he was calling on his readers, you know, 97 days to save your country, get out the vote and vote Franklin or FDR out of, out of office. So, you know, it's been, you know, pretty open throughout, um, throughout our history that, there's a political, you know, politi politics inform um, the choices that, that journalists make. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so some best practices, you know, it's, it's the idea of objectivity, I think is something that, I mean, critical thinkers know is, is over, oversimplistic. Um, so I share, I, you know, on, the, on, on this slide, I share a couple of, of best practices or working frameworks I like to keep in mind as a working journalist. Um, Things that include accuracy, you know, what, you know, facts do exist. Uh, what, you know, what can I do um, to the utmost of my ability to make sure I'm getting accurate information before I spread it around? Um, when I'm interviewing sources, when I'm going, you know, to do, to do my own research, I, I should be aware of who's funding the report I'm reading or, or what the political or, or financial um, objectives or agendas are of the person I'm interviewing. Does this person work for a specific government or candidate? Do they, are they receiving, you know, payment from companies, things like that. So understanding biases and agendas. Um, I seek to hold power to account. I think that's a, you know, a nostalgic, you know, sentimental, but but very real um, core value of, of journalism as well. The, you know, the best faith, faith journalists, I think, do seek to hold power to account. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, we should recognize as journalists that we do have a position that, you know, if, you know, we're, there's no way that, you know, as human beings, we are going to be 100% objective. Um, and we should be making that plain in a way that is suitable to like the medium and the, and the subject matter. So we don't always have to open an article with um, talking about ourselves and talking about our personal opinions on a matter, but we shouldn't actively seek to obscure it. And we should at least, you know, be aware that that is something that's informing us. And we should actively work to incorporate balance um, and to be accountable for, for what we're bringing as human beings to our reporting. Um, we should seek to minimize harm and we should act independently, avoiding conflicts of interest, never receiving payment for, for our work from sources, things like that. And definitely to refrain from sens sens sensationalization. Um, easier to write than say, but, um, but yeah, so we should, you know, seek to present the facts, but, but without in, inciting undue um, anger or, you know, sort of like pushing people towards retaliation or to play on people's emotions in a way that would manipulate them in a way that's, that's in bad faith. All right, let's, let's move on, please. Next slide. All right. So let's apply this to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, once again, Rhetorical question, silently on your side, just, you know, call to mind what, what words come to mind? What are, what's evoked when you hear the phrase Israel-Palestine? I included a pretty iconic photo because it tends to be one of the images that pops up for people's, you know, imagination when they hear that phrase. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So here are some of the top words that I, I imagine probably come to mind for you. Um, and that also just um, from a survey of headlines and reports, these tend to be very um, almost cliche overdone, um, often repeated words that, that relate to the conflict. We hear controversy, conflict, complicated, clashes, tensions, violence, dispute, breakout, stalemate, erupt, escalate, death. Um, you know, just sort of this, this, this looming cloud of 
bloodshed, warfare, violence, tense, anxious. Um, and then words like controversy and complicated mean, you know, make us sort of shrink back from trying to analyze it, right? So there's all this violence, there's all this conflict, there's all this strife, and we're also kind of afraid to approach it because it's controversial, it's complicated, you know? There's these eruptions and these escalations and these disputes, and, and we don't really know kind of what's causing them. It's almost like the weather, right? Um, and just for reference, I included a quote, it's by Edward Said, who's Palestinian, um, the critic and theorist, um, he wrote of Palestinians, um, we are known for no actual achievement, no characteristic worthy of esteem, except the effrontery of disrupting Middle East peace. So there's sort of this idea of like Palestinians especially um, are, are only usually mentioned in the news when they are dying or throwing rockets or involved in some kind of clash or some failure of the peace process, but we, we don't even really hear about the peace process anymore. Um, it's functionally kind of dead. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit tongue in cheek is this, this quote by Edward Said, but it, it, it really speaks to the idea of representation and coverage and um, the lack of nuance that, that people, people, when people are involved in these, or when people appear in these reports, they're usually as people engaged in violence and that's about it. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> So just a couple statistics, um, just to give you an idea of um, when you break this, you know, if we're, if we're zooming into that cloud where I said, you know, what comes to mind when I bring up Israel, Palestine, it's this foggy, hazy cloud of discomfort, dis-ease, conflict, controversy. Okay, let's, let's zoom in, let's break it down. Like there's been a lot of data analysis that can show us kind of where that impression comes from. Um, in 2019, an analysis of 100,000 American articles covering the conflict showed that the term Israel says was 2.5 times more likely to appear than citations of Palestinians and headlines centering Israel were four more times, um, were published four more times than those centering Palestinians. So that sort of speaks a little bit to who are we already starting to think about in more human terms um, when we're getting into just getting our information about the conflict. Um, it, it tends to center Israelis rather than Palestinians. Um, and then, you know, sort of also being very selective in what we talk about. Um, since the Israeli military took control of the West Bank, there's actually been an 85% decrease in the mention of the term occupation. It's sort of kind of faded more and more into the background of any discussion, even though it continues to fuel a lot of the so-called clashes. Um, we, don't, we don't really hear about that. Um, despite the fact that it's been intensifying. You know, they've taken, you know, the occupation has expanded, it's gotten more, um, it's gotten more violent. Um, and yet we hear less and less about it. And we also hear it's, a, you know, this report found that there are 93% decline in mention of Palestinian refugees. Um, keep in mind, again, the, the opening image of the young girl um, facing down the Russian soldier, the, that was actually a Palestinian facing down the Israeli soldier. Um, we hear a lot about refugees, Ukrainian refugees lately, and we're very um, sympathetic to them in general in the West. Um, but you know, there still are millions of Palestinian refugees. And, and as this report showed, we, we barely hear about that. They've been very naturalized, kind of just forgotten, not worth mentioning anymore. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Just one more, one more little um, snapshot of some statistics. MI, an MIT analysis of 330,000 New York Times articles um, which, you know, again, we tend to think of the New York Times as sort of our standard of, of objective reporting, um, or just a default, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous. So looking at the New York Times really does give us kind of a good idea of what we're looking at as far as decent journalism in the United States. Um, the reports are more than twice as likely to refer to Palestinians using the passive voice, more on that in a minute. Um, and to use violent language describing Palestinian individuals and groups than it was to use the same language for Israelis. And an interesting note as well, um, in recent years, three New York Times reporters were allowed to report on Israel-Palestine without disclosing to readers, without making public, that they had sons serving in the Israeli army while they were reporting on the conflict, you know, supposedly objectively. But this goes back to the best practices. You know, we understand that human beings all come from a position, all have things that influence their, their position and opinion um, of, you know, how they're reporting. 
Um, but it's important to make that known or at least not obscure that. And that is, you know, a pretty, pretty major thing to neglect to disclose that you are reporting on a conflict while your son is a soldier in one side of that conflict. Um, so it was actually independent journalists who exposed three times in a row um, that there were three separate reporters with sons in the Israeli army. So again, um, just trying to be maybe not, a, maybe objectivity is elusive, but fairness and accountability and transparency are not. So we could, we could demand better from the New York Times. All right, next slide, please. Um, so why there's so much bias in US coverage is beyond the scope of our discussion tonight. However, um, just a few, a few things um, to sort of sketch out maybe some of the context for this. Um, there's the impact of the pro-Israel political lobbyists. Um, so there are millions of spent by um, political, political action committees basically um, in the United States that influence Congress people um, and, and other you know, institutions of power. Um, and that definitely has a feedback loop with our medium. And you know, there is no Palestinian counterpart that's comparable as far as power, clout, money. So that is one sort of thing that's tipping the scales. Um, Western journalists have better access to Israeli sources or they feel they do. Um, Israeli sources are usually more savvy. There's a huge PR apparatus that's employed by the, US gov uh, the Israeli government. Um, that are usually much more technologically connected and more culturally relatable as far as, you know, Western um, journalists are concerned. It's just easier, you know, these are people that they can meet in bars in Tel Aviv, you know, because they're living alongside these people. It's much harder to go to the West Bank, let alone, you know, Gaza, um, to actually talk to people on the ground there. Um, that's just, that's just one um, other you know, sort of stone on the scale, sort of tipping it in, in one direction. Um, please, you know, you can never underestimate the ease and access, how much that, that can be tempting to a journalist to just sort of default to the same sources. You know, these sources tend to build up relationships with journalists over time, many of them do. And as a journalist myself, it's constantly a challenge to continue to seek out new sources, trying to go the extra mile or 20 miles or kilometers to cross like literal or physical, um, literal or metaphorical borders to, to speak to people that are harder to reach. But if we are, as I mentioned before, trying to hold power to account, we should be making those, those good faith efforts. Um, the US spends a lot more on Israel, 3.8 billion last year to Israel um, and spent only 2% of that in aid to Palestinians. So again, the feedback loop is something to think about. If, is, if the US is really invested, um, that's reflected in the media and the media kind of perpetuates that sort of um, investment. Um, there's confirmation bias, which we'll get into later. If we're used to hearing stories a certain way, we just keep telling them the same way. And then endemic Islamophobia is something to consider as well, not ruling out or, or not to deny the existence of anti-Semitism, which plays a tragic role in, in many ways in our society. Islamophobia does as well. And um, there's this inaccurate idea that all Palestinians are Muslims and you know Islamophobia comes into play that way. All right, you can go to the next slide, thank you. So just a couple, as, as educators, I wanted to give you a couple like tools or frameworks to start to help you and your students learn to sift through, um, sift through headlines. If this is what we're getting, if we know that there's, there's maybe some things to pick apart, some biases might be embedded even you know, in our um, beloved New York Times, how do we become better readers or better consumers? So flaw number one, for those of you who might you know, be inclined to grammar, it's the passive voice. Watch for the passive voice in headlines and in you know, the report itself. So here's an example. Um, this is from 2018 in May. Um, the headline read, Dozens of Palestinians have died in protests as the US prepares to open its Jerusalem embassy. So here the passive voice is present in the sense that Palestinians have died. It doesn't say who killed them. It doesn't say what killed them. It could have been, it could have been a car crash. It could have been COVID. It could have been the Israeli military. Um, so who killed them? Where's the actor? How are the protests and the deaths related? You know, it says they died in protests as the US prepares to open its embassy. Um, did the protesters kill each other? Like, were there people protesting each other? Um, it's just, it's very unclear when you really take a moment to look at it. Then again, 
we're so used to these kind of vague headlines where clashes are just happening and people are just dying that, you know, honestly, if I wasn't always trying to exercise this kind of critical thinking, I, I might have just let it slide by. So also note that there's no mention of Israel in this headline. Um, and we'll come back to this um, this headline at the end. I'll, I'll tell you more about what actually happened and we'll think about what could have been done differently. So passive voice is the first thing to watch for. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So number two is the absence of actors or attribution. So these actually will overlap. There was no actor or attribution in the first um, headline I showed you when I said there was no mention of Israel. It was Israeli soldiers that killed the Palestinians, but they just have died, you know? Um, same with this example. This is an even more bizarre one, in my opinion. Um, there are two different headlines for the same story. One was on Twitter and one was in the newspaper itself. Um, a missile at beachside Gaza cafe finds patrons poised for World Cup. You know, reading that, I, I personally would have no idea what they're talking about or what, what, what? <laughs> a missile found patrons poised for World Cup? Did people die? Whose missile? Why did it come to the cafe? Like, did someone send it or the missile just found them? Like, it's, it's kind of nonsensical. Um, and, you know, another headline for the same story, in rubble of Gaza seaside cafe, hunt for victims who had come for soccer. Again, what? Honestly, honestly, what? Um, it doesn't tell us again, who were the actors? What, what can the deaths be attributed to? What happened was um, Israel was bombing Gaza in 2014 and a missile fell on a small cafe where some people were getting ready to watch a World Cup match. Eight people died and they had to dig through the rubble to find them. Um, and Israel later explained that they were targeting a single suspect, they, a suspected militant, who was not present and not among the people who died. But um, again, we just see a kind of haziness, a kind of lack of any real like clarity of who's doing what. We just know people are dying somehow. And this feels irresponsible or at least lazy. Um, so lack of attribution is the, next, is the second thing to watch for. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So here's just another quick example of both. There's passive voice and there's lack of attribution. Violence on Friday, just violence on Friday, kind of like rain on Friday. It was sunny on Friday, violence on Friday, no instigator, no actor, um, but it included an incident where four Palestinians were shot dead by, we don't know. We don't know who they were shot dead by. They were shot dead, passive voice, after breaching security fence. The security fence referred to here is the, is the very tall, big cement wall. It's often referred to as a security fence, but that's another, that's another talk. Um, so yeah, these are just plentiful examples. These are all the New York Times, again, just to, to give more, yeah, to flesh this out. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so flaw number three, thing, third thing to look out for is implying false equivalence. So over 70 killed as Israel, comma, Palestinians exchange worse violence in years and prepare for more. This is from last year, 2021, when um, violence broke out. Another headline from the same week, um, clash at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa scores injured. So in the first story, 65 of the over 70 killed were Palestinians, including children and six Israelis. And then the second story where it said scores injured, 97% of the victims were Palestinian. So again, this we understand that there's um there's a there's a limitation on space in a headline, but um, many studies have shown that headlines impact readers' understanding of an issue as much or more than the actual content of the report. So headlines, it's not just like cheap shots that I'm taking here, not my interest at all, but it is a very important um, way that we understand how people, how our brains are just become more and more conditioned to think about certain stories a certain way. So if 90 to 97% of victims are on one side and not the other, it really um, feels like you could do something a little bit more accurate by making that clear instead of just saying, you know, sort of implying that it's a, it's a more symmetrical um, conflict. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can elaborate a little more on that. So the reality is verifiably asymmetrical. So here's just a small, quick infographic. We won't dwell on it. Again, this is beyond the scope of this talk, but you can see 
Um, above the line, those tall red stacks are Palestinian casualties over the last, since the first end of fall, that's since 2000. And then underneath where it extends in the sort of darker red is what um, the Israeli casualties look like. So this is just one small example of, of the lack of symmetry and why we would assume and expect that, you know, if we look at Ukrainian, the coverage of Ukrainian and Russian um, coverage lately, um, it's always very clear that, that there's an asymmetry of power, but that tends to not be highlighted in the way we talk about Israel-Palestine. So Human Rights Watch as recently as last year issued um, a report highlighting, calling Israel, um, Israel's regime apartheid, you know, no longer being very nuanced about it in the sense that it's become very clear sort of what the balance of power is. Um, and I encourage you all to look more into that if you're curious. Um, and last but not least, if you go to the next slide, the fourth flaw, the last one I'll get into today is one I've been alluding to all along, which is just sort of the naturalization of the conflict. Again, this gets into the passive voice and the lack of attribution. It all kind of goes together. So these phrases like tensions escalate, clashes erupt, conflict heats up, violent surges, protests break out. Again, it sounds like you're talking almost about the weather or something that's inevitable, that's out of our control, that's not related at all to human choices or human decisions or politics. Um, and it also it really dehumanizes both Israelis and Palestinians. It kind of implies that these people are just genetically predisposed to fight and that these are just, you know, sort of, it's just a feature of the climate there that, that violence breaks out. Um, so we, we wanna watch out for those sort of um, implied inevitabilities in the, in the way people talk about it. Who's starting what? Who's, you know, firing what? Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So details matter. So out of the 114 articles that covered the outbreak of clashes last spring, which I, I had brought up earlier, only one mentioned even just one important detail, which was that the people of Gaza were undergoing collective punishment at the time, including blockade of food, medical equipment, and COVID vaccines, as well as repeated electricity break, uh, blackouts, which were preventing people from being treated in the hospital for their wounds, the same time that they were being bombed. Um, how do these details change how we see the conflict? What other details might be missing? You know, as the Washington Post ran one article and out of 114 articles, no one else really mentioned the suffering that was going on in Gaza that prompted the protest, that prompted the retaliation, that caused violence to escalate. So, you know, we can't encompass everything in quick reports, but we, again, we, we wanna ask what, what details might be missing or are these people just, did they just feel like going out and starting, starting some violence today? You know, what we know about humans is they, they're not as predisposed to their own annihilation as, as we seem to think, you know, people in this region are. All right, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so here's a very recent example and we're winding down here. Um, so just a, one more recent example. Um, and this, is, this shows how when we're used to, to receiving narratives in a certain way, it can cause us not to be critical. So on the left, you'll see, this is the, the lead or the opening sentence of a New York Times article reporting, um, many of you may have heard, a very famous and important um, Palestinian journalist was killed. Um, well, on the job in Janine in the West Bank last month. And um, the New York Times originally reported it as a journalist for Al Jazeera was fatally shot in the West Bank city of Janine early Wednesday during clashes between Israeli military forces and Palestinian gunmen, the news organization and the Palestinian health minister said. Um, now, this was a misreporting as well as, you know, just kind of ambiguous and using the passive voice. So we inserted clashes, they inserted clashes and Palestinian gunmen, um, whereas, and said that this was according to the Palestinian health minister. The Palestinian health minister came out immediately, denied it. He said, I didn't say that. He also denied that there were any Palestinian gunmen present. Um, people just, you know, it, it might have been a case of the reporter assuming that the clashes were happening and that there were two sides. But what appeared to have actually happened, according to more local sources and according to things that came out, you know, after that, it looked like she was actually just shot by a sniper. Um, and so they, they corrected it a little bit. They said a journalist was fatally, a journalist for Al Jazeera was fatally shot. Um, and the, the Palestinian health ministry blamed Israeli forces for her death. So that is a little bit more accurate. That's a little better, but 
it's just very interesting how these clashes just appeared out of nowhere. And so did the Palestinian gunmen. And the irony actually came to us this week, if you can go to the next slide. So the New York Times themselves did a month long investigation of the death. That's a, that's a shot of, of Shireen Abu Akla right before she died. Um, and they found that actually Ms. Abu Akla was fired, um, fired upon by an Israeli military convoy and probably by a member of an elite unit, AKA like a highly accurate sniper. So they went from implying that there were clashes, including Palestinians and Israelis fighting each other to admitting and finding through their own investigation that she was actually probably sniped at a moment when there were actually no clashes at all. So this is a bit of journalism self-correcting, but it just, it's interesting how naturally we go to those, those frameworks that I talked about. Um, if we're not being careful, there's clashes and two sides and, and they're just fighting and we don't really know the details, but you know, of course they're fighting. We, they're always fighting, right? That's, that's how we tend to receive that. Um, you go to the next slide, please. So last but not least, I wanna take you back to the very first uh, story that we saw. Um, remember when I said, this was, this was reported in the New York Times as dozens of Palestinians have died in protest as the US prepares to open its Jerusalem embassy. So that's a picture of side by side happening simultaneously in 2018. That's Ivanka Trump opening, like inaugurating the embassy in Jerusalem while um, people are dying in a protest in Gaza. So this is from the New York Times. Um, we can go to the right or go to the next slide. So you could do a class exercise. You could, this is like, I think a great chance um, to sort of like apply these, you know, frameworks that I've been int introducing tonight to come up with your own headline or just ask yourself, um, what, what would I write or what would be a more responsible or nuanced way to, to write a headline? So you, uh, you know, just a suggestion for an exercise would be to give, give the context that I shared earlier and add this, these details, which you know, I hadn't shared before, which was, which include Gazans were in the seventh week of protests commemorating 70 years of dispossession and occupation that week. Over the course of a few hours, 58 Palestinians were killed, including several teenagers. More than 2,700 Palestinians were injured. No Israeli casualties were reported. At the time of the protest, Gaza was in the 11th year of an Israeli imposed blockade, which was classified as a humanitarian crisis by international aid groups. And according to international law, Israel does not have legal claim to Jerusalem as its capital. Israel occupied East Jerusalem, which is historically majority Arab, um, by force in 1967. So to move the US embassy there is in, in, in a sense, de facto recognition of an illegal annexation. So hence really upsetting for Palestinians and also for many other people who just respect international law. Um, so you could give students a story like this and ask them, what would you do? Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, how would you create your own headline or your own opening paragraph? Um, and you could do this with any, honestly, any you know, domestic story, a new story from another part of the world. And it's, you know, in welcoming you into my profession, our work, it's, it's difficult. You wanna encompass things in a way that's easy to understand, especially in a headline, you wanna grab attention, get, get the main point across, but you still wanna be responsible. So it's not easy and it can make us, you know, um, much more responsible readers and writers. So try avoiding using passive voice, balance context and content, include attribution and try to reflect the actual balance of power. So good luck on that. Um, so that was just um, a little bit of like a suggestion for you as ed educators to kind of maybe potentially take back to your students. I um, mean, go to the next slide. Um, and here's a, you know, just to hearken all the way back to our, the beginning, um, that's Ahed Tamimi. This is a beautiful mural of her on the uh, barrier separation wall in, in Beit Lahem, in Bethlehem. Um, just remembering, you know, that, that strong and defiant face that, you know, I'm fine if, if she wants to be, if, if, if the Ukrainians want to make her an emblem for their, their struggle, but, um, you know, She's also a, a symbol of the Palestinian struggle and it's important to take lessons from that. Um, so that was a little bit um, from me and um, thank you for your attention. And I'm excited to continue this discussion with Tom. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this was really a great presentation. 
Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to have a bit of a chat with Sarah. Um, the rest of you uh, in attendance, we will get to your questions, I assure you. So if you if you do have questions, you can start putting them into the, the Q&A. Um, I want to go back to a couple issues that you raised um, earlier in the first, go back to a couple issues that you raised earlier in the presentation. Um, first, you, you talked about the issue of kind of the access to the powerful um, and how that's easy for journalists. Um, I think maybe you could also say that if it's not necessarily a measure of credibility, it may be a measure of, um, you know, journalists may see it as a measure of seriousness and in terms of being able to talk to important people and get the opinions of these important people. Um, you know, one of the, the kind of uh, historical uh, examples that, that I recall in this regard was the embedding of journalists in the Iraq war that was seen as kind of this example of where if you wanted to get the story, well, here's how you were going to get it. You were going to get it by embedding with soldiers and then probably getting a very biased take on whatever was happening around you while you often maybe felt it at personal risk and felt that you were getting some level of protection. So although you didn't use this word, uh, and maybe out of you know humility, uh, there is also quite a bit of courage that goes into journalism and going that extra 20 miles, like you said, or going out into a battlefield uh, or going out into a situation of personal risk to get a more nuanced and complete story uh, does put one at personal risk as the example of Shireen Abu Akhla um, tragically shows. Um, so I guess I, I wanna kind of recognizing that, that, that you know, that's um, an aspect of journalism. I kind of want to flip the question a bit and say, um, what what kind of, um, or how can maybe consumers of media and consumers of information also be a little bit more courageous in terms of, um, you know, the diversity of sources that we seek out, um, how we ourselves can step away from the official sources a little bit more um, because it is one of the one of the advantages of our current media landscape is that we have access to an innumerable um, number of sources and information. How we learn to trust those is a completely different question. But I mean, maybe how how would you say that maybe as advice to consumers of media in terms of you know the work we can do to go beyond like the official sources? Well, that's such a big and important question. Um... Thank you. I, I do think that one of the most exciting things about journalism and, and um, specifically trying to cover areas of conflict, um, underreported stories, et cetera, et cetera, is just how much more um, people are finding, people within these conflicts are finding um, the ability to speak for themselves. So citizen journalists, you know, um, whether it's in Syria or in the West Bank or you know, South America, all over, you know, um, we're seeing so many people utilizing everything from TikTok to Twitter, to blogs, um, to podcasts, to um, just share their own story. And again, you know, there is sort of this, this sense of the stamp of legitimacy. If you see something that's printed by the New York Times and you do, you know, fall into your own, you know, the, you know, similar questions of bias or, you um, I guess, verifiability when it comes to citizen journalism. But um, I think that that's actually a route that's really worth exploring. I, as a journalist, um, I know many of my fellow journalists as well, we owe so much to the folks that we're connected to um, who are much closer to the action or the danger. Um, and, and we you know, work hard to cultivate relationships with people that we trust. And um, it, it, it is not too hard for even just the lay person, the non-journalist person to discern, you know, when you're looking at a source that, that's legitimate or, or potentially, you know, very illegitimate. Um, so there, there's one account that I would recommend people follow just for Israel-Palestine um, issue is Mohammed El-Kurd. Um, it's E-L-K-U-R-D. He's someone who lives, his family um, lives in Sheikh Jarrah, which is a, a neighborhood in, in East Jerusalem that's actually been the center of a lot of the so-called clashes and protests lately. And um, he and his sister, Mona, um, have published a lot of videos and live tweets and things like that, that you can kind of read simultaneously with the news reports. And they respond to mainstream in English and, and Arabic um, they respond to the mainstream reporting in real time. And it's a really interesting um, way to consume the news because 
there's some checks and balances now. We've seen actually many, many more instances of the New York Times and other major news publications having to correct their own stories or headlines because these these people on the ground are tweeting at them with in like incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence that they've missed something or they've reported inaccurately. Um, so I think it's good for journalism. It might be a headache for the New York Times reporters who have like been used to just being the authority, but authority is becoming more disaggregated in many ways. Um, so yeah, I would encourage people to kind of look into it. And there, there are a lot of these folks have very large followings. Um, so that's not always a measure. <laughs> Twitter followers are not always a measure of legitimacy or, um, or morality, but, but um, there's definitely a lot of possibility there. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I, I mean, appreciate the really, the um, in your presentation and in your answer, the really concrete advice that you provided for everyone here. I think that, you know, we, we want as many takeaways as we can in terms of uh, things that can be applied in the in the classroom. Um, let, let me continue a bit more on the issue of bias. Uh, when you when you raise the issue of bias, you talked about, I guess, you know, what we could call both conscious and unconscious bias. So, you know, perhaps there are cases where people have a real personal stake in in um, the story, and they're not they're not revealing that, and and in a way that's perhaps a more malicious kind of bias. Um, I think unconscious bias we would also see see as very insidious, um, but in some ways maybe it's a little bit more hopeful in the sense that once people recognize it or find the tools to become aware of it or learn to check themselves. Um, they may actually want to work on unconscious bias. So that's maybe the, the positive side of that. Um, but when, when you're going through these examples of kind of like use, the use of the passive voice and these completely like absurd phrasings that we find in some of these media articles, um, you know, it's, it's hard for, uh, often you'll see people talking about these, like, can you believe the way the New York Times framed this? You can believe the way media framed this. Um, and it's, it's infuriating, but it's also very hard to kind of attribute agency or, or the particular cause to the journalist. So say if we were going to, 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 you know, sit down with some of those journalists and say like, why on earth did you choose to phrase it this way? Um, that, you know, maybe they do have that conscious bias, maybe it's unconscious bias or the routine, or maybe it's just their way of saying, I want to distance myself from this to either a peer objective, or, you know, maybe they would say candidly, I know there are very attentive observers to these issues and I don't want to be seen as coming down on one side so I, I hide myself underneath all that passive voice mm -hmm. um, and they may have a human you know whether it's legitimate or um, not the, an explanation for that um, so in terms of uh, again like going back to the kind of consumers of information um, and and how you know, how they relate to that, how they get past that step of saying just like the sort of, you know, the recognizing that there's some kind of bias here, but then getting past the, the, the sort of impossibility of attributing sort of like full agency to that bias. Um, what, what do you think are maybe some of the, the practical steps? I mean, beyond what you, I think you've already outlined some of this with, in terms of breaking down the passive voice historical mm -hmm. context, but is there anything else you would say in terms of dealing constructively with these kind of moments of outrage? From the journalist perspective or from the consumer's well, perspective? Well, I mean, I, fr primarily from the consumer's perspective, like we're open up the New York Times tomorrow and we see one of these horribly phrased mm -hmm. passive voice mm -hmm. things, um, you know, uh, instead of just saying, like kind of just casting it away, what, what do we do to sort of start to, um, you know, have better media literacy beyond beyond what you've already said, because I realize you've outlined this to some degree. Yeah. Well, that's an important, you brought up sort of like whether, you know, to put it more crudely than you did, that some journalists just don't have a spine. They recognize that they're, <laughs> yeah, it's weak. You know, a lot of these people have great educations. They know how to not write in the passive voice, but they do. Um, that's, I, I could give another presentation on that. It is very frightening um, to be a journalist to try and sort of speak in a more active, you know, with a more, more active voice to, you know, you know, to put it that way. Um, and to be attached to some of these institutions, there's, there tends to be a limit um, to what you can do. Um, there's sort of like this, this veneer that people don't want you to pierce, even though, like I said, like, objectivity is 
sort of, um, you know, few, I feel like few people really use the word objective anymore in, in earnest. Um, but then there is just sort of like a way of speaking about things that most people tend not to breach. So that is what we continue to get. Um, as a consumer, um, I would say, you know, it depends on how committed people want to be, but if it's something that, you know, maybe this presentation or other, or for other reasons you feel a little bit more passionately about after walking away tonight and you want to do something, I mean, write, a, write a letter to the editor tweet about it, um, you know, write an op-ed, like these things are moving the needle. And um, I didn't, I thought about including it, I didn't have time, but um, we are starting to see a bit of a shift even in American media last year, last May with the, with the bombings in Gaza and all of that and um, what's followed. And, and thanks to citizen journalists like, like the uh, El Kurds and other people, I think that there is getting to be more awareness and like I should have neglect to admit like uh, neglect to mention that there's like an insurgent small but very scrappy you know Jewish left that is starting to hold um, the mainstream more to account about you know they want Israel to be better too um, and so every voice every tweet every letter counts and um, you know the reason that I didn't mention this but the reason that newspapers went from being partisan to being objective was basically to sell papers. They wanted to stop selling just to their party and, you know, just their little bubble and start to selling to more, you know, broad constituents. And if they know that their readers are, are not happy with the way they're covering certain issues, I mean, it's not for not to, to write even just a short email. It doesn't have to be, you know, bring out your quill and feather and write a like very formal letter, just shoot something off into the ether and you never know um, what that can do. So, and then, you know, then, you know, in your own personal life, taking what you take away from the newspaper into the real world, just, yeah, I, I would encourage you, you know, if you use the filters that we're discussing tonight in, in informing your understanding and you go to outside sources, I put in the chat a few NGOs some human rights organizations um, that fact check, that, that report on human rights, that try and hold the Israeli military and government to account, and the American as well. Um, you should have more than enough, you know, that'll keep you very busy, so I hope that answered your question. No, very much so. I mean, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think one thing that, that I try to point out in sort of teaching media studies is, is how much the interactive nature of media that we sort of take for granted now is still relatively new. I mean, it didn't used to be that even just like the comment section is something that didn't used to exist. You know, you didn't pick up a newspaper and have a comment section where maybe you could have an immediate response. And so yeah, I appreciate again, all of the very practical examples. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question before we go to the Q&A. And this just goes back to the, 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 uh, the bookends of your presentation with the Ahat Mimi uh, example. Um, but that first example of the, of the, uh, the sort of misidentification of the, uh, of the story to the Ukraine um, war, um, is, is, is a pretty good example of just what we would call like generically kind of misinformation today. And probably one where maybe it's really hard to, to um, find the origin of it. It really may just be somebody completely, you know, mistakenly uh, highlighted this or, or maybe not the, the originator of the meme or whatever, but that it was then just circulated and sincerely and people had completely, you know, it was just bad information circulating. So, I mean, this is one of the great um, concerns we have now about, you know, consumption of media. That's why we're kind of apprehensive a lot of times in our own media consumption. It's also something that, um, you know, political forces will by kind of sowing a lack of trust or sowing uh, just, you know, uh, bad information to kind of uh, dilute uh, attention to the truth. So, I mean, do you have any advice just on that general phenomenon in terms of like, the, the advantage we have of having so much information, but then, you know, what, what are some of the practical tools that people can use just in general uh, social media consumption around, uh, around these issues to kind of, uh, I guess, like uh, fortify their, their, their trust a little bit. Yeah. I mean, every day I'm worried that I'm going to repost the wrong thing. Like it's, it's like I triple check everything. Um, and it's one of many reasons why I barely use Twitter or actively retweet things. It's like, it's a lot of work to try and be responsible online. Um, 
I think one of the, the quickest like red flags for me is I mentioned like journals shouldn't sensationalize. So if something's really sensational, I feel like that's, it's, uh, you know, like I said, the first red flag is, you know, this feels like it's pulling on my heartstrings a lot, which makes me want to hit that repost button, but that might actually be the biggest reason to pause, right? Um, these are how, um, you know, mobs get inflamed. I, I'm careful about using the word mob, but I mean like literal, like, like, religious violence and ethnic violence have been ignited, you know, against Muslim minorities based on like false WhatsApp, you know, chain letters and things like that. Like not saying that it's always going to rise to that level, but, but if it's playing on your emotions, I would say that that's like um, something to watch out for and just something to do a little research for. Um, there's a lot of um, pointer and like um, a lot of other fact check websites out there that pick up on these things pretty quickly and um, like a quick Google. I know that sounds oversimplistic and it's not like I'm here to give Google more dollars, but I mean, a quick Google can save you some embarrassment at the very least. Um, so I would, I would maybe do that. And again, just like start to follow people that you trust. Um, and that can be another good way of like pre-filtering content for you um, because there are people whose job it is to kind of disseminate these things. And, and social media can be a great way to consume these things, but um, when it's too streamlined, it's too flattened and it's too like emotionally satisfying or emotionally um, raw and poignant, um, I would just be careful, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, uh, I really appreciate um, um, you know how targeted your answers were to some of my, my big questions. <laughs> Um, and thank you. I thank you everybody for indulging uh, me with like kicking off this discussion. So I, I do want to get to some of the attendees uh, questions as well now. Um, so we'll transition to the Q&A. Um, and the first question we had uh, is from Alexa, who asks, why isn't the word equity used instead of fair? So and maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, is there a better way to conceptualize objectivity or, or maybe an ideal of objectivity that that is you know that kind of puts it moves us away from this this you know simplistic idea of fairness i really like that word equity um i think i was using the word fair maybe because it's a little bit um more I don't know, mainstream or a little easier to understand but equity is um a great word that i think is really instrumental in a lot of discussions right now whether it's talking about racial justice or um, diversity and things like that. So equity, um, I'm not an expert, but what I think it might um, point to or like ask us to consider more is what is like truly just rather than fairness. Fairness can almost be, you know, if we learn fairness on the playground as kindergartners, it can be like, well, I get to take a turn and then you take a turn and then you take a turn. But if we're dealing with um, historically marginalized people or a gross imbalance of power, fairness in the idea that some people might have the idea that fairness means 50-50, like equal time. Um, this is something that you sometimes hear of like equal air time or like you quote from the Israeli side and then the Palestinian side, but equity is a deeper word that asks, asks us like kind of like what I pointed to, like, well, what was going in, on in Gaza at the time of the protest? Oh, they were in their 11th year of blockade. They were being like, Ban the barred even COVID vaccines, you know, those sort of things. Like an equitable report would have made plain um, sort of the harm, the general harm that's going on around this individual clash or something like that. So I really like that suggestion of using the word equity more. I don't feel like I see it a ton in journalism discussions, but I'm gonna like definitely keep that in mind and try and use it myself. So okay, so let's be sure we give credit to Alexa for. Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> uh, so let's go to Julie's question. Uh, this is a question about sort of PR, um, kind of, I guess, the relationship between PR and journalism. But um, I think that Ms. Aziza mentioned that the Israeli government has a PR firm. Does PR training include teaching folks to use these tools, such as using the passive voice, et cetera, deliberately? Are journalists taught to be very deliberate in avoiding these missteps? Uh, such as such as using the passive voice or implying false equivalences and so on. Um, that's a good question. So I have not been trained by the Israeli government, um, so I can't speak directly to what they would tell me to do. But um, it's there's a lot of branches to it. If you want to look up, I'll type it in the chat. Hasbara is the word that's used like specifically for the promotional 
campaigns that the Israeli government tries to put out. Um, I also recommend looking at pinkwashing. These are ways, pinkwashing is um, sort of a branding campaign that Israel has undertaken to sort of promote um, itself as like a gay LGBTQ friendly um, destination in the Middle East, which it portrays as this, you know, barbaric, homophobic, violent place, you know, just sort of like casting itself in a, in a positive light in, in contrast to Arabs that are writ large, you know, negative and homophobic. Um, and Hasbara in general um, tends to, you know, there's a lot of a lot of subtlety to a lot of the ways that journalisms or journalists are groomed. I would use maybe the word more like groomed rather than trained. So there's a lot of free programs that high schoolers and college students and then professionals um, can have access to if they're invited. Um, I actually know many, many people have gone on these trips. They get free trips to Israel. They get wined and dined and toured. There's sometimes a perfunctory um, skim of the West Bank or, you know, maybe in an Arab um, neighborhood. Um, and, you know, this is sort of like getting back to the idea of fairness. These, these like Israeli PR tours will include something of the, the Arab perspective, but in a very controlled and sanitized way. And all of these soft ways of sort of, you know, forming a journalist's opinion. Um, and then when, when personal relationships are involved, if you're like based maybe in Tel Aviv, if you're in the Jerusalem Bureau, and these are the sources that you go to, and it's just your bread and butter is, is interviewing these, these folks, like you don't want to piss them off or, you know, you, you build up rapport, you have beers with them. These sort of things influence the way that you want to report. And you kind of um, backpedal a little bit um, in calling them out and holding them to account. Um, so I think the passive voice and things like that are more of the product of this conflation of friendship, grooming, um, bias, but then also just not wanting to rock the boat. And maybe, like I said, there's the confirmation bias of you grew up reading about the conflict this way, um, or, you know, just omissions as well. You know, certainly um, no PR, you know, exactly like PR, PR um, personnel is going to mention the Gaza blockade. Um, you very, really rarely hear Gaza mentioned in any fashion by anyone unless they're talking about Hamas. So there's a lot of omission involved as well. So I think these kind of things all um, kind of accrue to the kind of coverage that we see. And I, I think it's um, also fair to mention, like a lot of journalists think that they're doing a good job. Um, and so to be too direct in, in dictating to journalists how they should write about something, I think that would be too on the nose. And we pride ourselves, right, as Westerners, I'm, you know, a member of the Western media, so I'll include myself in that as being um, independent, right, and and critical. So um, we're not we're not like Russia, we're not like China, is what we love to tell ourselves. So um, so these sort of misinformation, disinformation, and, and bias kind of have to leak in more indirectly. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, we'll go to Maria's question now. She, she writes, as, a, as I understand things, it is illegal for Israel to occupy the Gaza Strip uh, and for, as you mentioned, move, uh, as you mentioned before, move the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, what can be done about this? Who oversees that these occupations do not happen? And she notes it kind of reminds me of Texas, by the way. So, um, I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit more about, um, you know, those frameworks uh, and maybe sources for kind of learning the, um, you know, the inner, sort of the legal discourse around these issues, international law. Um, just, just so, you know, uh, you know how, how do you provide more depth to those kind of, uh, those kind of issues? Sure. Um... So I didn't quite hear, I think it kind of, it broke up the very like first part of that question was um, about the US moving its embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, well, it's uh, illegal for Israel to occupy the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Um, and I guess by implication that that moving the, moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem. Right, right, right. So I just typed into the chat, Diana Butu, she's a Palestinian um, lawyer who's one of many um, who's great at um, breaking down. She's written a lot about the like ins and outs of like the, the legal aspect of the occupation and, and Israel in general. Um, so that's one person that 
Um, you could you could Google her name and, and maybe find some stuff. But I mean, if you could just go to Human Rights Watch um, in the 2021, um, I'm just typing in the chat, Human Rights Watch 2021 Apartheid Report. Um, it's very comprehensive and very user friendly. It breaks down the different aspects of the Israeli occupation and the way that it's broken international law, continues to break international law, and how that's contributing to, you know, we, we use the, fra the phrase peace process as if that there's a process, as if there's like momentum or motion happening. Um, oops, can't see it. Okay, someone reposted it. Thank you, Joya. Um, I was using the chat incorrectly. Um, so, the, but the peace process in, um, isn't really a process right now. The process, if anything is proceeding, it's the continued annexation and occupation of Palestinian land. And that's why clashes happen and that's why peace doesn't. Um, so yeah, I would just encourage you to just Google a couple things. Like Human Rights Watch is very mainstream and very easy to read. You don't have to, to go to law school. You don't have to read legal journals to, to get a good overview of that. Yeah, thank you. I, I think a few people in the chat were noting that they weren't seeing the messages. So I think Joy is going um, to just gonna repost, repost those for everybody. Change. Yeah, I've been typing yeah, so, some, yeah, been trying to type some helpful hints, but now Joya has more work to do. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, with the, I think the webinar sometimes chooses who it directs your comments. Mm -hmm. So, um, so just another uh, question. Um, uh, this is another big question, but again, any resources would be helpful. How would you suggest to investigate um, into the history of the Middle East more objectively? Any recommended resources? Um, of course, you have the CMES outreach page, which I'll give a plug for. Yeah. And, uh, CMES events. But aside from that, what would you recommend for uh, resources? Do that. Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say that a great place to start from a historical perspective, if you want to understand the roots of the conflict, and, and you don't mind reading something, it's 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 user friendly, but um, it's it's history. It's the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine by Alain Pape. That's if you want to go. That's like an origi. That's like been around for a few years now. But it's an Israeli historian who goes through and breaks down exactly how the Zionist project um, un, unfurled, kind of, you know, sort of before, you know, going back to the early 1900s and how, you know, the state of Israel was declared and and you know how it displaced half of the Palestinian population and. And so forth. So that's a great place to start. Um, I'm blanking on a couple other. Oh, you know, um, anything by Rashid Khaledi? Let's see. Um, the Hundred Year War on Palestine is actually maybe if I could just um, recommend one book, um, that would be the that would be the book, The Hundred Hundred Years War on Palestine. Um, by Rashid Khaledi. Um, so I can post that in the chat, hopefully correctly this time. And um, yeah, I, that's, that would that would be great. And then I, I posted, I hopefully Joy will repost, but I posted a few websites, 972 MAG, Electronic Intifada. Those are two like alternative ones run kind of like by Jewish editorial and then with Arab writers as well. And then one's more like run by you know, Arabs and, and non-Arabs alike. Um, so those are two great alternative um, publications as well. And then, you know, Amnesty International, if you wanna be, um, you just go that route, the human rights human rights monitoring route. And Beit Salem um, is a Jewish organization that documents human rights violations and really breaks it down. Um, and then uh, last but not least is uh, Visualizing Palestine is a great place for like infographics and really simple breakdowns. Um, so. Thank you. Um, it looks like Joy is like keeping track of what I'm saying. Um, and yeah, so that was all Israel-Palestine related. You asked about the Middle East in general, and I don't think I'm prepared tonight to, to give you a survey of all of that, but um, maybe I can send some along the way, but you'll be on a great track if you follow even just a couple of these. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate that. I'll, I'll just note for those of you in attendance that a lot of uh, um, uh, on our CMS Facebook page, we have a lot of uh, events that have been live streamed over the past two years now, really, um, including a book talk by Rashid Khalidi about his 100 year wars on Palestine. So uh, I believe you can still find that on the CMS Facebook page. And if it's not there already, it should be up on the CMS uh, YouTube page at some point soon. But um, if you want to, I don't know if Krishna can maybe see if you can dig up that video on Facebook and put it in the chat. 
if we still have it. Um, so let's go to another question by um, Isaac. Um, Isaac writes, sorry if this is somewhat off topic from journalism, I don't have data to prove it, but it, it is likely that most Americans that go to Israel travel through um, travel there through Christian Holy Land tours. I know that these tours are highly curated um, and essentially erase Palestinians, their heritage, history, et cetera. How do you think this affects the ways in which Americans consume media related to Israel-Palestine? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's actually, I think, undercovered and the awareness is pretty, yeah, minimal that there is this huge link between evangelical Christianity and Zionism and that that's, yeah, really augmented by a lot of these Holy Land tours. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I just think that the erasure, you said it, it erases Palestinians and it erases the conflict. It's, it's really bizarre um, how one can walk through certain parts of Israel and Jerusalem and feel like you're in America, you're in the US, or, you know, I've heard it like into, I mean, I feel this way when I'm there sometimes, it's like Christian Disney World. There's just like churches and like slick advertising and souvenirs and shopping and things are in English and there's ice cream. And again, I just think I mentioned in um, my presentation that something that influences the bias and the framing is like that Americans just feel like in a cultural, a lot of Americans feel like this cultural affinity to Israelis. That's not an accident. That's actually something that Israel has tried very hard to cultivate, to portray themselves as just like, just like Americans. You know, we're lovers of democracy. Um, we're scrappy. Um, you know, Americans still have this like, you know, anti-colonialist, like we rebelled against King George. So we're like the underdog type thing. Israel has a big underdog complex too, even though they're like one of the, they're a nuclear power and one of the most powerful armies in the world. Um, so there's a lot of reason, you know, a lot of Israelis are Americans who made Aliyah, meaning I'm a Jewish person who's coming from nowhere. And if I move here and stay for a little while, I get citizenship and land and all these things and I can move to the West Bank and take land from Palestinians. So there's like a lot of Americans who are actually Israelis as well and vice versa. So how it impacts media consumption and how it impacts the media, I think that it's just one more way that people feel like they want Israel to win. There's all sorts of, if you wanna research it, all sorts of beliefs in, in some sects of Christianity that like Israel is, you know, they would need to support Israel so that Jesus will come back and the end times. And there's a lot of theological stuff that I'm not an expert on, but for all those reasons, people want to consume certain types of stories and will call stories that are critical of Israel biased. Um, and that when there are stories that erase Palestinians, there's less and less reason, you know, there's a fewer and fewer people that will call them out, right? Because they went to Israel and, and you know, their experience was an experience of erasing Palestinians. So they're not gonna notice that Palestinians are being erased in the media. So. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I did notice we have a question in the, in the, in the chat that was not in the, um, the Q&A box uh, from Adi. Um, who writes, I would be happy if you could explain why you believe some context is more important than others. For example, you haven't mentioned why Israeli soldiers were in Jenin, where the journalist Shireen Abu Akhla was tragically shot. They were there following the Palestinian terror attack in Elad in an, in an attempt to stop a future attack on Israeli citizens. It does not tell us who shot the journalist, which was not yet determined, by the way, but it does tell us that Israel was not there in an attempt to shoot any journalist, perhaps a better quote unquote fair framing of the subject would be to say that we should work to advance a solution for the current state of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and that violence intentional or unintentional cannot be avoided in such conflicts without such a solution. Um, yeah, I mean, that's fair, uh, fair, <laughs> there we go. Um, so I didn't want, I, I was rushing almost at the end because I didn't have enough time to um, cover everything. The story of Shireen Abu Akhla is still ongoing. I've written about it. And as I mentioned, the New York Times just published a, um, the results of their month long investigation. And you're right, it's not completely a closed case yet. The Palestinians have call, called for an international investigation, um, which the Israelis have been resisting so far, but we'll, that, you know, all remains to be seen. Um, there was a like increase in, in violence on both the Palestinian and Israeli sides leading up to the raids in Janine. 
Um, Shireen Abu Akla was there to cover a raid. Um, these are all Ill illegal raids. And um, as we noted, um, you know, the New York Times believes that it was um, someone had firing at on Shireen, who was decked out in complete um, press civilian garb. She was clearly labeled, you know, she had the big vest. If you look up pictures of the actual killing, she was wearing a, a vest that said press on both sides in English. She was wearing a helmet. They announced themselves to Israeli soldiers as they walked in. Um, so it, it appears to be a, yes, a casualty of the ongoing clashes that do result from the fact that we have not achieved peace yet. Um, so do I think that some context is more important than others? Mm, I think all context is important. Um, I didn't have time to cover all the context, but um, I'm trying to look, I actually have a copy of the question here um, in an attempt to stop future attack on Israeli citizens. Well, that would be, you know, I don't think we have time to cover, um, you know, the full extent of that question right now, um, but Amnesty International and other um, objective international bodies have unanimously and repeatedly said that, you know, these sort of like Israeli raids and retaliations are vastly disproportional and that uh, many of the um, so-called defensive raids, raids that are going into prevent future attacks um, are pretty indefensible from an international law standpoint, from even just a practical standpoint. Um, a lot of them uh, amount to collective punishment, arbitrary detentions that are also illegal under international law, just fear, um, fear-based tactics and, and the terror, terrorizing, like the indiscriminate terrorizing of civilian populations, people who are already under occupation. Um, so that's context too. Um, but again, I, I wasn't able to cover every bit of nuance, and that's why I keep um, offering up historical um, sources that you can go on, on to read for yourselves, as well as many, many Jewish and secular non-Jewish um, NGOs and human rights um, organizations that document these things and break them down in excruciating detail. So that's all out there, and I encourage all contexts. Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, we've reached the end of our, I think, our submitted questions. So we will, I will give a sort of final call for that. Um, but if uh, absent that, I was wondering if perhaps you could just um, give everyone a little bit more information on um, where they can find you and follow you uh, out in the world, social media. Yeah, sure. Um, you can just look up my name, Sarah Aziza, A-Z-I-Z-A. Um, I'm freelance, so I'm kind of all over the place, but I'm actually primarily right now focused on um, a book. I'm writing a book right now, so I'm publishing, but I'm publishing a little bit more sporadically than, than I tend to. Um, but I welcome, I welcome any new followers. My Twitter is not super active, but say hi. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can find me on my website. Um, just Google my name. Thank you so much. Um, and without seeing any uh, other questions, I just really want to thank you for such a great presentation and uh, this, you know, incredible opportunity to interact. Uh, and I really thank all of the uh, attendees as well and all of the great questions we have. It's really nice to have this kind of opportunity to go into depth on this issue. Um, that said, uh, Krishna, I don't know if you have uh, final words and want to promote the following uh, subsequent programming. Yes, please. Um, so thank you, first of all, thank you both so much um, for your insights this evening. Um, it made a fantastic conversation and um, Sarah, especially your presentation was so insightful. Um, and I also really you know, personally appreciate you sharing so many resources with us. Um, I'll be sure to basically compile a list of those resources um, and send them out to everyone in a follow-up email. Um, along with uh, your website and um, any other kind of book recommendations that you had given. Um, just before we close, I do wanna draw your attention, especially to upcoming events in the 2022 Summer Institute for Educators series. Um, the first of those um, is going to be, um, sorry, let me get my, where did I put that? Um, never mind. 
Um, sorry, I could not find my slideshow. Uh, the first of those is actually going to be a webinar um, on Thursday with the journalist Ben Mock. Um, if you signed up for this webinar, you should already be uh, signed up for that webinar, but you're also welcome to go back to um, the registration page if you, if you didn't manage to. Uh, ben will be speaking about um, the Uyghur community in China and disinformation campaigns regarding um, the network of prisons uh, in um, Xinjiang, China that have been imprisoning Uyghur uh, people. Um, we are also hosting a in-person workshop on Tuesday, June 28th, uh, in which you'll be able to uh, see Sarah again. Um, that is going to not only involve a panel of all the journalists who have participated in this webinar series, um, but it's also going to include a keynote lecture by Dr. Seema Yasmin on disinformation and media literacy. It's going to include workshops with Pulitzer Center staff and also Pulitzer Center teaching fellows, uh, which is a program that if you are a Chicago-based educator, you are eligible to apply for. Um, so uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, again, that's going to be happening next Tuesday, June 28th at the University of Chicago campus. Um, it's an all-day workshop. Uh, there will be pizza um, that sweetens the deal. And um, yeah, once again, it would be great to see you there. Thank you again for taking your time uh, on this evening to uh, attend this webinar, and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, last but not least, if you'd like CPDU credits uh, for attending this webinar, please e feel free to email me. Uh, I believe Joya has posted my email in the chat. Um, you'll also get an email um, in the follow-up uh, with my email in there. So um, without further ado, uh, thank you again, Sarah and Tom, so much for this fantastic presentation. And we hope to see you at our next SIE event on Thursday. Take care. Thank you so much.